Hello, I'm Matt. And I'm Keith, and in this one we'll be discussing our dream workshops. Quite a big topic, so in this episode we'll be covering workshop setting, aesthetics, layout, size, storage and dust extraction. And in the next episode it'll be workbenches, machines and tools. And we'd love to hear some of your ideas about what the perfect workshop would be for you. So please do get in touch. Morning Matt, so what have you been up to recently? Good morning. Um, oh, well, you throw me with that question. I don't think I've actually got much done because last time we spoke was the heat wave, so mm. I wasn't working. My tripod broke, so I had to send it off. So I didn't have a tripod for a week, so I couldn't film anything. Then uh, my dad's not been very well, so I kind of went off to see him. So I think I've pretty much done nothing since I saw you last. Oh, wow. I hope your dad's okay. Uh not really, but yeah, that's uh, another story. Right. Uh, sorry to hear that. What have you been up to? Um, I've also not been doing as much as I would have liked to have done, mainly because I started building a new log store. Um, but in the process of doing that, I managed to injure my back and I couldn't really do anything for three, maybe four days. I, I just twisted it funny. And funnily enough, I caught the moment it happened on camera. Mm. So... I'll make sure I put that in the video because um, it was a stupid thing I did, really. I, I jumped off the top of the log store, trying not to tip it over because normally I would have just climbed down it, but I made a bit of a leap of faith and uh, landed funny and just twisted my back. And then after that, I took my wife on a road trip around Wales for four days, so I haven't been as productive as I'd like to have been either. So did you jump off thinking this would be YouTube gold? <laughs> I wish I did, no. <laughs> to be honest, I, I wasn't even aware... I'd captured it on camera until I was doing the editing. I was like, ah, oh, that was the moment. <laughs> I did my back uh, doing the garden room. After carrying all those sheets and things, I was fine. And then I dropped something on the floor and leant down to pick it up and twisted my back. It's always the, the I mean, jumping off a high thing, you know, I can understand it going. But, but usually, it, for me, it happens when I'd least expect it. It's just yeah. a funny movement kind of thing. Yeah, or you sleep funny or something. Yeah. So what are you building the log store out of? Are you using um, Tongue and Groove or Feather Edge? Or... I'm using whatever I had in storage. The sort of projects I really enjoy because it's completely just resourcefulness, yeah. finding what you've got to use and building it out of whatever you've got kind of thing. And uh, I, I spent virtually nothing. I think I spent less than £50 building it. The other factor is that I did it in a day, um, mainly because I had loads of firewood piled up at the front of our house and we're about to have scaffolding put in um, around the bungalow for the re-roofing works that's about to happen. So I wanted to clear it all quickly, so I thought I'll, I'll try and build it in a day. And I kind of managed to do it, but then I obviously hurt my back and I thought I'm going to wind things up. So you're going to have a, a log burner for this winter? Yeah, um, it should go in in the next two weeks. Uh, and particularly with everything in the news at the moment of uh, energy costs and things, that's going to mm. be great because i imagine you've got so much scrap you could get rid of i have yeah i managed to fill up the log store and the log store is pretty big as well i mean it's it's eight foot long 2.4 meters long and it's about 1200 mil high four foot high so basically the size of a, a full sheet of plywood um, yeah and then it's about 600 mil deep so um but it's it's nearly full so hopefully that will last through the winter I've never had one in my... I had one in pubs, I worked, and you go through loads. But in the workshop, I didn't go through much because I was never aiming to get it to 20 degrees. If it mm. was at 13 degrees seemed to be like the magical number for me. That was shirt sleeves, comfortable working. If you had it at 20 degrees, what you want your house at, you're dying actually trying to saw things. Yeah. It's too hot. I used to have it going for like two hours in the morning and I'd keep it warm for the rest of the day in the workshop. I was creating more scrap wood than I could burn. Oh, really? Mm. So I'm thinking, I spend my days in there. I want it to be comfortable. You've got to heat it in some way. So a wood burner seems obvious. But what I'm thinking is, I do voiceovers for videos. I record podcasts. I would like to build the next workshop. I've done the previous ones. I have three by twos. I'd go for four by twos, deeper insulation, uh, the acoustic stuff. And then I could use it as a studio as well. If I have the fire going during the day, why am I heating my house and my workshop? If I was recording the podcast, I'd be out in the workshop now next to the fire. 
no <laughs> no i wouldn't because it's summer but in in the, in the in the winter i'd be out there i don't say i regret the last workshop but i found my notes the other day actually is about 3600 spent on it yeah including the wood burner which is expensive oh wow I, I, I don't know if you saw... You did see it because you commented on my last vlog. So I've got the tent at the moment, which is great, but obviously not secure. That's the main issue with it. It's three metres by six metres. I can buy a metal garage, flat-packed, which I imagine you get put up in the day for around £1,000. Is that all? Yeah. Obviously no windows, and it would still be roasting in the uh, summer and freezing in the winter. But, but you, if you framed it out on the inside, you could add windows, couldn't you? That, yeah. But it's so tempting. I mean, I could literally just put it on the credit card and next week have a workshop and move my tools into it. And it's so incredibly tempting. But yeah. I don't know if I'd hate it, but I'd never be happy with it. Mm. It'd never be what I want. And... A consideration for me and you is we make YouTube content and I've just... Well, I'll probably get a video out of putting it up because I think it would be interesting. And I'm looking around my living room. I've got a router table, a mitre saw next to me. I've got a dust cycler and I need to do an extractor, a workbench. It's a oh, mitre saw stand, fat. It's, it's just... I would love all this stuff not to be in here. But if you know you're not going to be ultimately happy with it, you, you don't want that disappointment in a few years' time, do you? No, but that's the thing. But if I was going to move in a couple of years' time, it'd be stupid spending the money when, if I put a £1,000 garage up, I've got a shed with pretty much no roof that looks scruffy. So it might add a £1,000 to the house going, it's got a garage, or at least it tidies up the garden. I wouldn't lose much money doing it. So it's a consideration, but my... I would love to build one, and uh, I'm hoping that would be the thing. And I think if I'm here for at least three years more when I build it, I think it's worth it. Mm. Are you thinking of moving in the longer term then? It depends how finances go. I mean, the news this morning is we're going to go into recession and interest rates are going to hit 15% and mm. stuff. So things are not looking great at the moment. It's uh, Winter looks almost scary because I'm yeah. kind of breaking even financially, but as soon as you go into a recession, we make money off adverts on mm. YouTube. All that will go down. All the marketing People... budgets will be pulled, won't they? Yeah. yeah. So it might be a just trying to survive. So it might be next year that I have no money. Building a workshop is out of the question. So I might go, well, I just need one. So just by way of a bit of introduction, this was an idea suggested by one of our listeners, um, David Shortall. And the topic is basically what would be our dream workshop. So your first talking point is setting. Go on, explain what you mean by setting. So um, by setting, I guess I mean surrounding area. Um, and the first thing I thought of when I thought what would be my ideal workshop setting was Neil McGinley. Yes. Oh, beautiful, <laughs> isn't it? He's basically got this beautiful um, Scottish lake Beautiful People are Scottish shouting lake. lock now. Is it a lock? Sorry, yeah. And then a few other people sprung to mind as well. All I think all YouTubers, there's a there's a guy called Ari Baloney, um, who I think has stopped uploading woodworking videos now, but he's overlooking some beautiful countryside. Neil has built his with kind of the, the French doors or the patio, whatever you call them. How would you get any work done, though, oh. with that view? It's a beautiful workshop in every way, I think. I yeah. love everything about it. I lo he's, he's painted the walls in farrow and ball. I think it's called downpipe, mm. which is obviously expensive, posh paint, but it looks really dark grey, and you'd never paint your workshop walls really dark grey, but it looks great. And then he had all these metal tool cabinets, and then he bought sliding doors in front of them to hide them all. Mm. And his tall wall is just... Again, this is why I don't want the metal shed. Even though I could, over time, make it nice, being in a place that inspires me is kind of important. My old workshop in Hampshire, I loved the kind of 200-year-old stone and brick walls. Yeah. And the beams, I found it... In, sometimes I'd just go in there and stand in there. I yeah. like, just like being in the room. I don't know, that's important, I think. Yeah, although, I mean, we'll come, out, we'll come on to aesthetics a little bit later, probably, but... Um... For me, I don't know why. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I love the aesthetic workshops. Uh, like Neil's workshop is absolutely beautiful on the inside. But for me, I, I don't know if I would take inspiration from it. Um, I don't know. 
I, I guess it comes down to the individual and and what inspires you to to get creative. Yeah. No. Well, we're all different of different things, but I know that if I just want to be in that space, yeah. I don't know. I I very much. It's going to sound like some spiritual nonsense, but. I think rooms have a, a feel to them. So I was looking at houses. You walk in a house and pretty much instantly you, you know if you like that house or not. Mm. And I find that really strange. And there's no logic to it because you've obviously chosen to go and look at that house. Like it's the right size, it's in the right area, it's the right budget. And you just walk in the room and go, no, just don't feel it. Doesn't feel it. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Every time I've moved into a house at the viewing prior to moving in, I've, I've definitely had that feeling of, right, this is the one, This is this is it. And so the workshop's the same. And to be honest, I never really liked my last workshop. No? No. I think it's maybe because I didn't like the area. And so maybe if I'd moved it to the side of a lock, it'd be different. (laughs) But I think it was just too long and thin. In fact, someone suggested a shipping container and Mm. you just wouldn't be able to get it behind the house. So it's a non-starter. But it's basically the same size as the old workshop. And it's just long and thin. Mm. And I think that would be fine as a workshop, but filming is really difficult. I think the more square a workshop is for filming, the better. There's a few things that I think make up the ideal setting in my mind for the perfect workshop. One is as remote as possible. I want to be as far away from other people as possible. Two is it's at your home, so it's not a big commute. I'm constantly in and out of the workshop throughout the day. Mm. I'll apply a coat of finish, I'll come inside, I'll do some editing, I'll go outside, put another coat of finish on. And I can't imagine having to commute to a workshop. Oh, no. I know for some people that works, because some people like that separation of work and life, don't they? Yeah, well, again, this is just our personal preferences. Other, mm. Yeah, other people would absolutely hate that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, one thing we've both had a problem with, my Hampshire workshop and your one currently, is the main road issue. Yes, so you've insulated and you've pretty much solved that problem. Uh, I couldn't because I didn't own the building. Being on the main road is great for deliveries because deliveries, if you're getting that's true yeah. timber delivered, sometimes it's coming on a, a lorry and it's a real issue for me here. But it's not so much of a problem now that I'm not producing products and getting big deliveries. Yeah. I mean, there are two issues in my mind of having of being next to a main road and and both of which really frustrate me. The first is having a queue of traffic outside and if you're out in your garden doing some work or something and every single person in the car is just staring at you. Mm. I, I hate that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm quite a private person anyway. And secondly is, is actually being on YouTube and being kind of somewhat known. It's a security thing. I don't really want people knowing where I am. I had a bunch of messages in the past saying, oh, I know where you live. I've, you know, I, yeah. I don't like that at all. It just doesn't make me comfortable. No. And a lot of the things we're going to say are very YouTube centric, as in, if you weren't on YouTube, then being by the main road and the noise wouldn't be an issue whatsoever. When I was just in the old workshop, um, not filming, wouldn't notice the traffic noise. It's only when the camera's rolling, I would notice it or trying to talk to the camera. It was, the outtakes were hilarious. I don't know if you had this. I don't think I swear much, but when I was recording <laughs> and a lorry would go by, the the words that were coming out of my mouth, it's just so frustrating when you've done a, a good like 40 second roll and you've, you've, you think you've nailed that take and then just at the last yeah. bit, something goes by. <laughs> what about you? What is your ideal setting? What have you got in mind for that? Yeah, I I love Neil's. I'd love to live somewhere beautiful. I also think by a woodworker, living by trees makes sense. Mm. I was looking at some houses around Thetford Forest. Yeah. Um, Prices really uh, went up last year and they kind of went out of my budget within a few months, unfortunately. Mm. But I thought, oh, I bet the Forestry Commission, they they often sell the logs and things and that would just be a, a, a great story to be able to use local local yeah. word but what my dream setup was say something the size of a four car garage and then but upstairs it has an upstairs and that's Ooh. like a, a bed sit or you, probably in a four car garage it wouldn't be a bed sit you could actually get a kitchen a bathroom a bedroom and a small living area and yeah. maybe downstairs have a a toilet and a wet room as well so you could actually 
like jump in the shower before going upstairs. And I'd seen things like it. They're very rare. Yeah. But there were things for sale, but nothing kind of in the right area or budget. And like, I would just love that. I, I lived in a shepherd's hut for a bit. Yeah. So I can live very small. I can't workshop very small. Mm. Especially with filming, it's just so hard. And uh, no guest room, so no one can ever come and stay. <laughs> or, or I could build a shepherd's hut to go outside. But yeah, in fact, it was somewhere in Norfolk. It was an old blacksmith's forge that had a setup like that. Really? And there's quite a bit of land. And it's like, oh, it needed completely doing. I could afford it, but it, I'd have no budget to actually make it habitable. And you probably need the same amount again, but it would have been amazing. And I know someone's bought it and just converted it to a house. Oh. And I feel that's... And that's what happens with all these things. And you see them and they've had planning permission to change them. Like, I don't want them to change them. Matt Astley has a nice one. Yeah. I've not. He's just put up a uh, workshop tour. I've not watched it yet. I think uh, Andy did a video about this housing development that was just for people that wanted that. And in the back of... There's a road down the side of the house, and in the back of every garden, there was a small commercial unit. Really? Yeah. I've not and seen that video. Well, that sounds interesting. Oh, maybe I dreamt it. Because I've tried to look it up since, and I, uh, like where this place is. But I think, what a great idea. And there's probably a really good sense of community as well, if everyone's been making something, or, I don't know, maybe you've got an online retail business, and you're shipping out of there. There's just... A bunch of small businesses all in the same yeah. area, like a community, yeah. Yeah, and the security's probably good as well because everyone's looking out for each other. And Yeah. Even more of a dream would be to get a plot of land and build that. Yeah. I don't know, 10 years ago, I probably thought I would do it, but now, like, I'm in my 40s and you think, oh, I'm not in a position to do it now. And then another 10 years, I don't think it's going to happen now, but yeah, that would be the dream. But yeah, buy some woods, buy some water. But then I like now being able to walk to a train station and a cafe and things. See, I've got no such con- conveniences where I am. We don't even have a shop in our village. Everything is a drive away, but that suits me fine. Well, I lived like that for over 10 years in two different villages, and I liked it. and I loved going out for walks there, but now I can pretty much see a Chinese takeaway from my front door. Sometimes a change is good, isn't it? You, yeah. You live the country, and now I'm in a very small town, and it's it's like a metropolis to me. Yeah. It's so exciting. So in terms of size, what do you think is the perfect size? It all depends what you're doing, doesn't it? So for both Andy and Peter, I think they wanted something quite reasonably bigger because um, if you're working with sheet goods mm-hmm. and you want a panel saw... I mean, you could put a panel saw in your workshop, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure you'd even have enough in-feed and out-feed. This is exactly what I was going to say, because when I first thought about what would the perfect size of a workshop be for me, my initial thought was I've got all of the space I need, I'm, I'm perfectly happy in my six metres by five and a half metres. Sorry, I don't know what that is in feet. But then when I thought about it, I have real issues with in-feed and out-feed on my table saw. I've got 1.8 metres of in-feed space and about the same of out-feed space. But there there have been quite a lot of occasions where I've wanted longer than that and you just can't do it. Um, Well, I say you can't do it. I'm very fortunate to obviously have a a little contractor saw um, from Milwaukee, which sometimes I set up outside um, if I want to make a really long rip cut. But yeah, that it would be great to have a bit more in feed and out feed space. But that that could just be a a layout issue. If I really thought about it and and moved things around, I could probably come up with a better solution. But the problem is when I moved into my space, I did a lot of thinking about what layout would work best for me. And I set things up on that basis, but I kind of set it up in a permanent way. So Mm. it's really difficult now to be able to move things around. So for example, I added that service column right in the center, which is great. It works brilliantly, but now that's in and there's power to it and everything's wired up. I can't really just simply move that. So I'm kind of wedded to this uh, this layout that I've that I created. What I really should have done is perhaps lived in it for six months or so, find out what worked and what didn't work. I think that's a, a good point. Every time I've moved into a workshop and set it up, I've never been happy with my initial setup. 
So that's why I kind of like building my next workshop in stages, as in so I won't be screwing anything to the walls inside because, well, there won't be any walls inside. Mm. And so I can really get a feel for it and move things around. But mine was six metres long. So a standard timber length is like 2.4 metres, isn't it? So if I had the saw right in the middle of the room, I could feed something in and feed something out. But I didn't want the saw right in the middle of the room. It made filming so awful having it there Mm. and not a good use of space. But I bet at one time you thought you'd never have a workshop as nice as what you've got now. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I said it when I moved in. That was my dream workshop and it still is my dream workshop. I'm so happy there. I can make large projects. I mean, like those two large gates I made recently. There's no way I could have done that project in my old workshop. Like I said, my first thought was that that size is probably right for me. It's just the in-feed and out-feed yeah. thing and, and being able to set up things around it as well because you, you need to be able to put things along the walls, don't you? You can't mm-hmm. just leave space dedicated for in-feed and out-feed space. It's a, it's a bit of a logistical nightmare. You mentioned earlier it depends on what work you do. That's absolutely right. I mean, I do such a variety of work. I'll do joinery sort of jobs, carpentry jobs, restoration things and filming as well all of these things require a different layout in many ways i see a lot of people organizing their workshops based on well this is my um milling area Mm. and then and then it goes over to here and everything's kind of in order that's great but for me that wouldn't really help because 90 percent of projects don't really follow that process if you know what i mean yeah i did set my workshop up temporarily like that back in lockdown when I was super busy producing things and doing the same thing over and over again and having every machine set up to use was great Mm. when you're always doing the same thing. Yeah, I have thought with my next workshop, if I have a mitosaur station going along one wall, you kind of want the mitosaur in the centre of the wall so you've got the same, let's call it in-feed and out-feed. There's probably a better way of describing it. But if I had it so there's at one end there was a door and if I wanted to cut something really long, I could just have the door open. Yeah. You could do the same with a window and have bits sticking out yeah. the window. Most of the time, you're not cutting long things. So mm. doing the odd cut with a door open is not really An a issue. problem. Yeah. yeah. And so I've, in the back of my notebook, I've got workshop ideas. And when I come up with these ideas, I scribble them down. Otherwise, you forget them. Yeah. I remember seeing Gid Joyner in one of his videos. He actually cut a hole in his workshop wall so that he could feed the timber through his <laughs> minor station, which I just thought was brilliant and also very funny. <laughs> I'd love to see a proper workshop tour of his because it looks ramshackle, like he's added bits on over the years and stuff. And I love that. One of the things I want to know about Gid's workshop is just how thick the layer of sawdust is on the floor. <laughs> Because I I don't know whether he's got any solid base underneath that, but it looks like it could just be a a dirt floor, basically. Really? I don't know, but um, there's so much sawdust on it, you never really see the floor. And is it at his house? It is at his house, yeah. Yeah. So, well, I've talked about noise and neighbours a lot. He's got a workshop that, well, he's cut a hole in the wall, Mm. and he's running a commercial business out of Mm. his house. So I think it all depends on the area you live in as well. And your neighbours. Uh, and I your neighbours, yeah. yeah. Good to be friendly with the neighbours. I mean, I've got this new person moved in and straight away um, I was like, oh, it's bin night tonight and oh, I'm not going to be here. Oh, well, I'll take your bin out. Trying to get off on the right foot straight away, I think, yeah. is, is good. Well, we're in a WhatsApp group with a few other people that do this and there's certainly someone in it that's moving house because of the problems with the neighbours. Yeah. So being away from people is good. But then I think if I put a 100 mil rock wall acoustic insulation in the walls i had 50 mil before and i would stand outside the workshop with i'd have the extractor going and the plane of thickness going and then walk outside the workshop yeah and there was a low rumble when i was stood literally outside yeah so i think you wouldn't hear hardly anything with 100 mil and no one stood right outside my workshop no, I totally agree. When I when I did that 50 mil rock wall sound slab to that that extension to my workshop, which had the compressor and mm. the uh, extractor, and I was amazed at how much sound that that stuff cuts out. It really does work well, and I've never worked with 100 mil before, but I can imagine it being amazing. I, I just had another thought about setting as well. Um, I think it's something you've mentioned in the past about setting up a kind of 
sheltered area just outside the workshop and for me the ideal would be having a sheltered area just outside the workshop where I could park my car and Mm. load in and load out but also move it out of the way and then have an area to work that's protected from the weather because whenever I try and do an, an outdoor project You check the weather app as much as you like, but you know it's going to rain at some point. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'd love a carport, which is basically what your pagoda thing is, isn't it? Yeah. A frame with the, what's the roofing called you've got? Polycarbonate. Yeah, something like that. And that would be great for, as you say, parking the car, but I don't know if you got some firewood that was damp delivered and you just shove it under there to dry out a bit, or I, I would like to get into welding and stuff if I didn't want to do it in the workshop. In fact, I did... I've been making my camera stand and I've had the angle grinder out yesterday with a flap disc and the mess it makes. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm only grinding a few little bits, but it's this black powder everywhere. Like, I'd have rather done that outside if I had a a bit to work. So do you have a bit of driveway down the side of your workshop you could build something on? Not really practically, mainly because... All of the space outside my workshop is kind of like a turning circle for cars um, Mm. getting in and out. So, yeah, there's no real practical way. I have thought about whether I could do something like that before, but it's not really viable, I don't think. Hello, Matt here. It takes us quite a lot of time to prepare and produce each episode of this podcast, and we'd like to keep putting it out for free. If you enjoy the podcast and you'd like to help support and shape future episodes, you can find a link to our Patreon page in the show notes or just search online for Workshop Banter Patreon. Thank you, and now back to the podcast. What about your ideal size then? Oh, I'm going to go for a four-car garage, I think. Yeah. I'm going to have something the size of yours as my woodworking shop, which would be the biggest one I've ever had. Then maybe a partition, have a single-car one as a metalworking one, and then a single-car one as a storage because you have so much tins of paint and finish i i got yeah. rid of i gave it away to someone that did like a handyman he loaded his car up with half filled tins of paint and was yeah. very very happy but over the years you collect so much and i go to do projects and go well, I'm gonna use that paint up but somehow the piles of paint and finish never go down and we're going to get onto wood storage but if you could just have a room with all your wood stored all your finishes Maybe those tools that you don't use all the time, you're talking like your Milwaukee table saw, Mm. if you could just have it in there and get it out when you need it. Yeah, having separate storage. I mean, again, I'm very, very lucky here in that I've got a large shed where I can store tins of paint and stuff that doesn't get used regularly. And also a storeroom in our bungalow, which sounds really random, but it's it's an old one-car garage. And you've done the garage door thing, haven't you, which is a great idea. Oh, the timber storage beyond yeah. the... Yeah, I mean, I, the criticism I had for that project on Facebook is, is you know, I read the comments and I want to cry. Oh, it's, I thought that was a good idea. It is. <laughs> and it's, to be honest, I think it's probably the best idea I ever had. It's serving me perfectly well, and yet if you read the comments on that Facebook video, it's all going to fall down instantly. And what, am I, what is it, two, three years on from doing that now? It's absolutely brilliant. Why is it all going to fall down? Well, this is just Facebook comment man mentality, unfortunately. Um, they didn't like the fact that I used plasterboard on an external wall. Obviously, uh-huh. it's not an external wall. It's got a garage door in front of it, and it's only ever exposed to rain if I've left it open accidentally or for a few minutes. I could go on and on. They don't like the fact that I drilled through the damp-proof course to fix the bottom wall plate to the floor but obviously there's a damp proof course underneath the concrete slab anyway so i was only really putting it in there in case rain splashed on the floor temporarily all these things it's just yeah a pain. people just want to moan yeah so i've just looked at the size of a four car garage and it's 34 feet or 10 meters by 20 feet or six meters and yeah now i've seen those sizes i mean that that would be that would be brilliant wouldn't it yeah because i don't want a warehouse i think when i was a chef we um took on a commercial unit and we had this like massive warehouse kitchen we pushed all the benches and things into one corner and worked in it yeah because you had to walk so far to get anything (laughs) yeah it was ridiculous i kind of like my workshop to be a bit cozy and nice yeah 
John Peters, he does a lot of videos, I forgot what they're called, but with a commercial workshop, he often goes there. And it's three guys. And it doesn't look much bigger than a four car, but there's three people working in it. I'd say it's a good sized space. If you ever wanted mm. to do the whole people come and work with you one on one type stuff, which I don't imagine either of us ever want to do. <laughs> I've had quite a lot of messages about it and no one could come and work in my old workshop. It'd be ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, Andy and his friend came and looked at it one day. Just three of us standing in there is Is crazy. Yeah. But yeah, four car garage. But I don't think I'll ever have a four car. I don't think I'll have a two car one. I don't think I'll ever have one as good as the one I had in Hampshire. Mm. But my next one is going to be bigger than the one I had before. So I'm going to be happy enough with that. Even with a workshop of my size, I mean, a few months back when you sent me a link to that drum sounder that was on Facebook Marketplace mm. that, that I tried to get, um, I really had to think about, how, you know, how would I incorporate that into the space that I have? I really had to, you know, consider what would I need to get rid of in order to get it in, and I don't really want to get rid of anything that's currently in my workshop. I think the thing I would get rid of if I had to, if there was another tool that I think would be more valuable, it would have to be the miter saw. I would have to use the table saw for everything. Yeah, I think it'd work in your workshop. I tried it because I see a lot of Americans, especially woodworkers, go, the miter saw is not a woodworking tool, it's a construction tool. Just use the table saw. But again, it's having a square workshop and the table saw in the middle. If you have a long, thin workshop, you have the in feed and out feed on the table saw, but cross cutting. Yeah, you can't. It's a nightmare. You can't do. Mm. And trying to cross cut like a two point four meter long length on the table saw, you just don't have the support. But when these Americans have saw stops with those massive tables on them, you can do it. But yeah. if you're trying to imagine trying to cut a uh, a two point four meter length on the Milwaukee table saw. Another idea for my next workshop is having the miter saw. So having cabinets on the wall as a miter saw station, but then the actual miter saw bit hinged so the saw folds down against ah, the wall yeah and then i just lift it up when i want it it sticks out then when you're using it but when you're not using it it's probably 30 centimeters mm. against the wall yeah sometimes having a small space makes you be clever actually doesn't it yeah it's like a lot of these flip top carts that you see um on youtube i've never made one because i've never really i, I think they're good for occasional use tools things like spindle sanders i've never even owned a spindle sander i've always managed to get by without one but if you had two tools like that and you had them on a flip top car i can imagine that being quite a nice space saving solution do you work on the floor much Mm. do i work on the floor uh what was i just building i was just building a boot bench and i was putting it together and i stood it up on my bench to put a piece on and realized i didn't have the the height. ceiling height yeah <laughs> so i moved it down to the floor yeah again in the next workshop i love the idea that the bench is now on casters if i wanted to say build gates like you just did mm. i could push everything to one end and have pretty much an empty room yeah being able to just wheel things out of the way and have a huge floor space when you're working on a large project i find invaluable when i first started laying out my workshop i thought everything needs to be mobile on wheels apart from the mitre station and now having sort of chatted about in feed and out feed space for the table saw the one thing that's in the way limiting my out feed space is that mitre station april wilkinson does a few great videos i think where she's got the mitre station on this little wheeled stand and then the wings fold up mm, i've seen those yeah yeah i hadn't thought about that but maybe that is what i need to do because then you could just pull it out to if you need more in-feed or more out-feed, you just move it. Maybe that's a really good idea. Hmm. I'm going to write that on my to-do list. <laughs> I quite like having my timber storage separate to my workspace and just having it somewhere else. I've got quite a lot of timber in my workspace as well, but I've mounted it really high at the top of my walls. But having a separate area for timber storage, I, I really like um, because it means I can ultimately put more tools and other things in the workspace. I say I like my workspace to be clean. It's a way we're different. I want my workshop to kind of be Pinterest worthy. <laughs> because that that's inspirational to me, but I, so I don't want clutter everywhere. I've never had one of those proper 
timber racks. That's kind of what you've got in your wood store, isn't it? Shelves or brackets. Yeah, I'm just using the, um, what are they called? Twin slot shelving. Mm. And, and I think they're brilliant. My only regret is I spaced them apart 600 mil when I built that wall. Mm. Um, the studs were 600 mil apart and I wish I'd have done 450. Not because it's unstable or it's not strong enough or anything like that, as the Facebook commenters would have you believe, <laughs> but purely because the spacing would be more appropriate for putting shorter lengths of timber on. So sometimes if I've got a shorter length of timber, you can only span two brackets, whereas it would have been nice to span three, for example. So that is my one regret with that timber storage wall is that I wish I'd have done the, the spacing. But I was working to a tight budget and to put 450 mil studs in would have cost me a bit more money. And at the time I didn't have any money because I'd just moved home mm. so yeah uh, I built that big workbench and I've been using the underside of it to store my timber but the trouble with that is I needed obviously the bit that was right at the bottom <laughs> and it took me about half an hour to pull everything out and you realize how much stuff you've been keeping and because I've been keeping bits that can be burnt but I have no way of burning them it's am I keeping them for next year or do I give them to my mum I'm going to build my workshop right at the back of my house where everyone has garages but everyone has these little summer houses I would like to build a well a bit like your shed something at the bottom of the garden I can put on one the back wall maybe a timber rack and put the gardening tools and tins of paint in there you don't reach for your wood throughout the project you get all the bits you need at the beginning i feel exactly yeah uh, as the tools you're reaching through constantly yeah uh, and you want them in there yeah th this log store that i just built i keep calling it a log store but it's kind of more of a firewood store because i'm never actually going to put logs in it but um mm. anyway i was thinking even if um sort of throughout the winter if i use a lot of that up to heat our home if i free up a shelf that's a whole shelf that i can use for for timber drying yeah. as well as a drying rack so that's quite a nice option as well what about other forms of storage i'm i'm a huge fan of drawers particularly shallow drawers i love those bisley cabinets oh, yes yeah. yeah adam savage hates drawers and says drawers are where tools go to die oh man and i couldn't disagree more I, I do kind of see his point because I've got three drawers in my kitchen and I was making some bread this morning and I was looking for my dough hook and I just couldn't see it because it's 10 items deep and you're rummaging around mm. as the Bisley ones. I can always find things because they're I don't know, four centimetres deep. So there's only ever one layer of stuff. But have you seen Adam Savage's tool rack thing he made? I'll be honest, I've never got into Adam Savage's stuff at all. I've never really watched... I've, I've watched a few of his videos, but it just hasn't grabbed me for some reason. It, I think this is very clever. And this is when I was just starting YouTube. I was very tempted to make it. It makes this A-frame thing. You know how people make A-frame clamp racks that are on wheels? Yeah. And they look great for the Americans in... Say if you had a four-car yeah. workshop and maybe you're one day working at one end one day you can move your clamp rack mm. he makes something like that with all his screwdrivers pliers every tool on so you can wheel it around and nothing's in and you can just grab it it looks great as well in a big space that sounds like a great solution yeah yeah drawers are good because they can go under things like under your mitosaur station or under yeah. your workbench i don't think i've ever had an issue with um drawers being a place where tools go to die personally i, I i'm in and out of them all the time mm. the one regret i've got really is that the drawers i put into my workbench i put i think three or four sort of medium depth drawers and i wish i'd have done like one deep drawer and maybe eight really shallow drawers because like you say, rummaging through them can be a pain. Having said that though, the deep drawers are useful as well. I've got another unit that I put underneath my router table where I've got all of my plunge routers in. Another person that has a very clean workshop is uh, Make Something, um, David Pesciuto. Yes, yeah. I mean, he's. I've never seen a workshop like it. It's much more like an artist studio. Carpeted. Way. <laughs> yeah, carpeted, yeah. funky wallpaper and paints and things. Bright colours, yeah. But here's the workbench where the drawers go out from either side and he keeps his clamps under the workbench which is exactly where you want your clamps that's isn't true it? yeah 
I've always found shelves under workbenches to be problematic for me. Um, they, they, it feels like a bad use of space because you can't really stack things up very well. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I think about what's under my large assembly table or workbench thing at the moment, it's um, my Milwaukee table saw, and actually that works really well because it just slots in there nicely, and because I don't use it that frequently, it's just a nice place to get it out of the way. I also keep things like if I need to rip down um, a thin sheet of plywood and I want something to stack it on top of to make the cuts with a track saw. I know a lot of people use sheets of insulation and stuff like that. I've never really had anywhere to put a big sheet of insulation. So I, I just tend to use strips of wood and I just pile them up on the workbench and put the plywood down on top. So I keep them under there as well. But other than that, everything that finds its way onto that shelf just feels a bit redundant yeah i'm with you on that because i as i was just saying mine was full of timber the only good thing is the bisley drawer systems they fit perfectly under there and everything's neat and i would like more of them and i've got the five drawer ones and i think that you can get them about 50 quid which yeah with timber prices well, you could spend that on drawer runners alone if you were making them yeah you could so how do you feel about drawers I love the shallow ones, mm. the the Bisley shallow ones. I don't think I had any other drawers in my old workshop. So dust extraction. Yeah, my main thought about this was, wouldn't it be nice just to have your dust extractor in a separate room? And I know I used to have that in my old workshop, but that's got to be the dream scenario, I would have imagined for most people, is, is having it separate so that you don't have to hear it you don't have to breathe in it's nasty exhausted dust and i know a lot of people exhaust their extractors to the outside world but then you've got problems with heat loss it's a bit of a minefield dust extraction isn't it i had a lot of comments about dust extraction telling me to build something like what you did which i think was a great idea but it was for my high volume low pressure one and what i found with the separator if so i used to buy rough sawn oak i would fill the was it 90 litre or 120 litre anyway big dustbin yeah within 20 minutes so if it was in a separate room makes it a I, bit less practical doesn't it yeah i'd be outside doing it and wouldn't know you don't know when it's full or you suddenly yeah. notice the chips are going everywhere so it just wouldn't work for me i see the people that have them the big commercial ones have those like four bag mm. dust extractors where they can empty it once a day or something yeah why not just make your workshop longer and then have the door to it inside or sliding doors inside Yeah, is what I thought. And then it's not... Because they're big, ugly things. The yeah. I mean, you've got, the, I think, the one horsepower uh, extractor. But if you ever go to the Axminster store and then look at the two horsepower extractor, you can't tell online, but they're literally twice the size. Are they're they? They're massive. Yeah. You, you would think they're just a bit bigger. They are huge. Ah, so if you had that in a cabinet at the end, uh, maybe with a vent going outside, you'd you'd reduce the noise to your workshop, but also you'd just be able to check on it. So I kind of like that. But I've I've moved away from the high volume, low pressure ones. Yeah, I've got the two motor cam vac. That's more than powerful enough to extract from anything I've got, mm -hmm. and it's just so much smaller. Yeah. Um. At the moment, I, what I've got is the problem with the noise because I'm in a tent, but in an insulated workshop, the noise won't be a problem. What I've learned over the years with the extractor is not really the noise of the motor that makes the noise. It's the exhausting the air. Mm. Yeah. As I think actually on your one, it has a little black port that unscrews. Like a diffuser type thing, yeah. I think. Yeah. If you unscrew that, a standard Henry Hoover hose fits over that. Oh, right. Put that on, it reduces the noise hugely. Does it? Yeah. I might have to try that. I'd forgotten to tell you that, because I used to have a Henry Hoover with the port, but they've moved... My new one just has a vent, and it's like, oh, why have you not got the screw-on port? But yeah, if you do that on that, it works great. But the same with the CamVac, you can buy hoses that go over the two vents... And it just works like a, I suppose, a car exhaust, um, uh, or uh, as the Americans say, which works better in this uh, context, a muffler. It yeah. just muffles the sound a little. 
Oh, right. So I do like the idea, but also it's the remote switching has been a real issue for you recently, hasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, just an update on that remote switching, actually, because I got a lot of people saying my solution of just using smart plugs wasn't necessarily a great solution because of, I don't know, I'm gonna I'm speaking out of my realm of knowledge here, but something to do with volts or amperage or something about it not being... Um, yes, I did read those and thought, oh, yeah, I didn't think of that. Yeah, but then I had another couple of people comment saying, well, he's only using it as an isolator so it's basically controlling whether the power is going to it or not rather Mm. than actually regularly being used to trigger it on and off so some people seem to think it's safe i don't know either way but all i can say is i've had no issues so far and you know i've obviously had no false triggers of it turning itself on anymore so it's working for me so far whether it's a good solution or not i'm not sure You're not on your train home from London and then going on your phone and going, turn the extractor on so your Mm. extractor's nice and warm by the time you get home. You're only ever going to be in the workshop. Yeah, when when I'm turning it on, yeah, absolutely. So you've got a piped system. Are Mm. you really happy with that? I'm very happy with it, yeah. It's it's served me really well. The thing I struggle with a bit is, would I have been better off using 100mm ducting with my... LVHP extractor, vacuum extractor. Both the cyclones you've used have been smaller, haven't they? So that yes, is a limiting factor. It is a limiting factor, but but would I be better off getting like a hundred mil cyclone mm. and oh, and all a hundred mil piping, or would that lower my velocity? Mm. I'm not sure it's so important with that style of extractor. I think with mm. the high volume ones, it is. Uh, and I always looked at those 100 mil ones until Axminster brought out that metal one that I think you can get for about 100 pounds. Yeah. The other ones were like 280 pounds or something. And yeah. it's just, there's no way. It's just yeah. such a lot of money. eBay and Amazon are full of these cyclones you can buy from China that cost 20, 20 30 quid. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they don't do a 100 mil one. Mm. Uh, maybe they have now. I've not looked in a while. But it always frustrates me because I would have bought one. But yeah, I've I had the pipe system in my very first workshop because I'd watch YouTube videos and that's what everyone has. But actually, I use different extractors for different things. As in when I'm sanding, I use more of a, a Henry Hoover style extractor or yeah. the Bosch one. And same with the track saw. And then I use the, the bigger extractor on bits of machinery I've, I've been using the trend router table i'm amazed what a great job the extraction is on it yeah do you find the extraction is quite good on your router table i use mine hooked up to the to the ducting that goes mm. to my vacuum extractor and it works pretty well actually i was surprised at how well it works um, but basically i just put a port in the fence that i built yeah so it's probably not ideal because it, it feels like i could do with something underneath as well yeah you could build a box underneath, couldn't you? Yeah. And just t- with a door you'd need, I suppose, to actually be able to access it. Because I always think that the router has got the worst dust extraction. Uh, mm. Maybe a jigsaw and a circuit saw are pretty bad, but I feel a router should, they should be able to do it. And I think the high-end ones are quite good, like the Festool ones are pretty good. But the router table, I'm like, oh, there's no... I expected loads of muck under the table, but it really was pulling it all away. Yeah, a lot of people just do the multiple shop vac solution, don't they? For you know, basically having a separate vacuum for for each big tool or machine, and I think that definitely works. But for me, the space saving of having the ducting makes it kind of worthwhile. Yeah, I had a uh, Nilfix, I think it's German mm. uh, extractor, really nice machine that, um, and it had the power takeoff. So on the mitre saw, the, just the fact that every time you pull the trigger on the mitre saw, the extractor comes on yeah. and turns off was just nice. Because yeah. I can't think of another tool, actually, that you're pulling the trigger on and off so many different times. Mm. And maybe with a, a minute in between where you walk off to mark another bit of wood and get it, yeah. you just don't want to be turning it on again. Yeah, although I, I have gotten used to it. I think it's one of those things you have to just be disciplined enough to to learn to do. Um, although, as we're talking about the dream workshop, having automated 
blast gates. I think I saw, was it Bob Claggett or someone like that do something like that with an Arduino? I mean, it's all mm. too technical for me, but, you know, if we're talking dream workshop here, that's got to be in there as well. Yeah, that is pretty fancy. I see the American systems with just this hugely powerful extractor and then lots of pipe because the more piping you have, the more powerful the extractor needs to be Mm. which is using loads of energy so even if you're just extracting from one little tool Mm. you've got this some of them say they've got a six horsepower extractor like that must be like the amount of power it uses to heat my house and you're just using it to extract from the miter saw yeah imagine running one of those on uh, uk energy prices and accidentally leaving that on for a few days (laughs) thank you for listening you can find Keith on YouTube by searching for Rag N Bone Brown and me by searching for Badger Workshop. We have a Patreon page if you'd like to help support us in making future episodes of the podcast. Link to that in the show notes. And we have a Workshop Banter Instagram and Facebook page if you'd like to get in touch, which is at Workshop Banter, all one word.